Stop we sharing. proceed to the next one, uh, which is Professor Jaco Nissinen from Alto University. Is Jaco over there? Perfect. Yes, okay. can you hear me? Thank you very much. Yeah. So he, he will talk about torsion and geometric and anomalies in non-relativistic topological matter. So go ahead, please. Okay, so this is the title of my talk, and I'm basically continuing from the from the previous speaker in the sense that uh, I will now try to describe some cases where I believe that kind of the non-relativistic physics and kind of extensions of 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 field theory anomalies uh, arise, and in particular, uh, topological phases of matter should be kind of uh, expected to have many examples of such uh, anomalies. Uh, and uh, there's kind of a lot of recent work, which is kind of uh, dealing with similar types of issues, uh, but kind of coming from, the, uh, from several different uh, perspectives. But uh, let me also uh, thank the organizers for the invitations to present my research and I should also say that if there's one thing which is kind of positive uh, about the current uh, pandemic, I would say that it's, it's the kind of uh, possibility to have such meetings where uh, many people can uh, come together basically independent of their uh, uh, precise geographic location. So with that, let me now try to uh, go to the outline of my talk. So. Uh, the previous uh, talk was already kind of giving a great introduction to anomalies and topological phases, uh, but I still will kind of uh, present uh, similar uh, 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 observations from more coming from the condensed matter uh, perspective. Then I will kind of uh, define and discuss the kind of uh, uh, things which I mean by, by having geometrical anomalies in contrast to say anomalies produced by, by gauge fields. And then I probably will run out of time, but I, I, I do have three different examples where I think that such uh, anomalies are uh, relevant and then I will, uh, end with some, some outlook. So this is the, uh, uh, a set of kind of uh, papers on very much kind of uh, similar uh, kind of themes and ideas. So uh, this is kind of the main uh, reference to the to the talk that I'm uh, now going to give. So uh, we already heard a much uh, about anomalies and topological phases, and kind of the important point is is especially the fact that uh, topological phases of matter uh, are uh, in some sense defined uh, by anomalies. So the most uh, familiar example is the uh, integer quantum Hall effect, where if you put a two-dimensional semiconductor or some other electronic material uh, to a strong uh, magnetic field, then uh, you will actually see that it will have current running uh, perpendicular to voltage. And this uh, current is uh, dissipationless, which is, uh, means that it's not kind of, a, uh, it's, it's protected by, by, by some, some very strong uh, uh, and robust uh, thing, which is basically the topology. And uh, you can also see that, uh, 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 irrespective of, of many, many different microscopic details, this current will be quantized uh, precisely to, to integer numbers. So that's indeed kind of the, kind of the, kind of the place where topology uh, comes into play. So if you want now to describe this system in terms of some type of effective field theory, which is valid at uh, low energies, it turns out that it's precisely of this chern simons form. And we already heard from the previous speaker that, that if you now do uh, gauge variations to this action, you discover that it's not invariant. On the other hand, 
the non invariance is, is, is localized on the boundary. And then when you kind of do this uh, anomaly uh, coefficient matching carefully, you discover that, that, that if this is describing the bulk uh, material, there must be a one plus one D uh, chiral fermion, which is now uh, living on the boundary. And you could say that the current which you, which you see, which doesn't have any dissipation, that's more or less kind of determined by this, this gapless uh, chiral fermion. And this kind of uh, idea can be generalized to all types of topological materials. And it has at least uh, two, three different names, but they all kind of arise to the same fact that, that, that there's kind of uh, protected uh, fermions localized on, on domain walls, boundaries, defects, and so on. And those are determined by the anomalies. So uh, kind of the condensed matter uh, viewpoint to this uh, topological protection is also manifested by, by the quantized uh, coefficient, which is found in this effective action. And this can now be written in, in many ways. And kind of the, the essential point again is that it's kind of some type of a topological winding number formula in momentum space. Uh, and kind of the interplay of, of momentum and real space is now kind of uh, displayed by this, this effective action. And uh, this is a very robust uh, framework. And then you kind of, kind of start writing down different types of topological terms, which as we heard from the previous talk are very uh, restricted. And then you kind of discover the, the, the usual topological phases of matter, which would be time reversal, uh, uh, symmetric uh, 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 materials with, with, with boundary Dirac fermions. And again, these boundary fermions are anomalous and they are uh, localized on the boundaries. And then you have the quantum hall effect, which I already kind of discussed. And then if you go to one plus one D, you would have kind of exotic, uh, uh, edge modes, uh, which, which are uh, determined by, by, by polarization. And all of these arise in the same fashion that, that there's some uh, suitable topological uh, uh, term, which you then can have in the low energy effective theory. And from these kind of gapped uh, topological phases by kind of a very well-defined framework, you can go to these gapless uh, uh, phases of matter, which are also <laughs> now uh, protected by topology in the sense that kind of the, the bulk has, has an invariant, which is now characterizing not a gapped phase of matter, but rather some, some type of a, of a gapless fermionic system. And uh, the simplest uh, example is actually the, the Fermi liquid theory, where you now discover that if you have a co-dimension one, surface uh, of, of zeros in, in, in three plus one D, then, then that will be uh, your Fermi liquid uh, theory. But on the other hand, you discover that there's also a topological invariant, which is, which is characterizing a, a kind of chiral fermions in, in three plus one D in the sense that co-dimension one uh, uh, fermionic zero is also topologically stable. And then you can kind of uh, write down the topological invariant in momentum space, which is uh, uh, protecting that phase. And actually this invariant is, is the same, which, uh, which we had for the quantum Hall effect. And that's kind of explained by the fact that if, if, you, if you compute this invariant around this, this uh, zero, it's everywhere gapped. And therefore you can kind of apply the same, same same invariant as for the quantum Hall effect. But uh, let me now kind of jump to the, to the thing which I kind of mean by geometrical uh, uh, anomalies. And now I can take this three plus one dimensional uh, uh, vial semi-metal and basically also implied by the chiral anomaly, I can write down the so-called anomalous quantum Hall effect which now comes more or less from the fact that, that, that uh, along some special direction, which is more or less 
determined by the by the by the location of the wild nodes. I can write down a kind of quasi topological effective action, which is no longer uh, topological in the sense that it will now uh, not be independent of the metric, but actually depend on on at least some uh, geometrical no. information. Oh, and uh, uh, what now comes kind of crucial is is the kind of non-relativistic uh, momentum space uh, geometry. And uh, let me kind of briefly uh, note that that indeed. This can be described by, by, by the presence of, of actual U1 fields. But on the other hand, it can also be kind of directly uh, described uh, utilizing this kind of momentum space uh, geometry and topology combined, and also in the way that kind of manifestly takes into account the fact that, that say, if you have some uh, non relativistic piece of material. It, it kind of uh, will kind of have inherently uh, symmetries that break uh, break Lorentz uh, invariance. And on the, on the other hand, those symmetries are also the things which are kind of uh, making possible uh, having such uh, effective actions uh, at low energies. So uh, in particular, if I just look at this formula, which basically now has kind of this extra crystalline or non-relativistic field uh, with no derivatives, I could also imagine a place where where this uh, crystalline field is 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 no longer uh, constant, but on the other hand, varies within this piece of material. And then there's actually quite a history of works, also kind of. Uh, very much uh, uh, in line with this anomaly inflow mechanism is that indeed uh, this term when there's non-zero derivatives of this field will break gauge invariance. But on the other hand, this gauge invariance is broken in a way which is con consistent with this uh, anomaly inflow mechanism in the sense that 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 the, the, that the breaking of 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 charge conservation is localized on a defect and, and therefore on the defect you have protected uh, uh, zero modes. And uh, this is basically kind of very well known. Uh, and now the point is that in what cases could you imagine other types of anomalies which kind of uh, also are somehow more, uh, uh, more characterized by, by geometry and momentum space rather than say, geometry of, of, of gauge fields. And this is now kind of the place where, where this torsional uh, or effectively torsional wild systems comes uh, into play. So uh, I can take kind of a generic uh, uh, band crossing in, 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 in three plus one D. And I always know that at low energies, I can write it in terms of this wild type Hamiltonian. But now, in contrast to, to high energy while fermions, I know that this is basically the first term of a linear expansion. And in this kind of expansion as applied to condensed matter systems, I kind of directly know that there are at least uh, three ingredients. So the first ingredient is that, that there is this kind of geometrical factors that take into account that, that kind of the coordinate momentum doesn't need to be aligned with the kind of uh, uh, coordinates of these these two bands. And the second point is that since this is a non-relativistic system, uh, it needs to break kind of either uh, parity or time reversal. And therefore I know that it's kind of uh, necessary that there's some uh, while node at finite momentum or at finite energy, but it has to be there. And then usually this is kind of a assumed uh, kind of uh, quite kind of uh, directly is that I can just shift uh, this kind of original fermion to be this kind of low energy fermion, which, which, is, which looks like the relativistic one in the sense that it, it, it's at zero energy when you sit at this node. 
but on the other hand, I directly know that that say if I have two nodes with opposite chirality, I know that such a transformation could carry anomalies in the sense that it's it's a chiral uh, transformation. And on the other hand, there are kind of general theorems which say that at low energy, always uh, if I have the wild node or rather a set of wild nodes with with some chiralities that the low energy Hamiltonian or the low energy Lagrangian is always of the Dirac form. And uh, therefore there's kind of an additional problem compared to high energy physics in the sense that there are essentially many, many things which you could have here in the sense that they will break uh, Lorentz invariance. They will rather be determined by the, by the microscopic details of, of the system, uh, which can happen in condensed matter. But uh, that's kind of the general uh, framework and starting point. But now, of course, comes the question that how would I kind of uh, induce such geometric uh, deformations or kind of, in the spirit of the previous talk, uh, this uh, Hamiltonian here needs to have some set of, 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 of background fields, which now uh, kind of uh, should couple as geometric fields in say gravity uh, in high energy theories coupled to fermions. And there's at least two cases where I can kind of expect such uh, fields. The first one is, is just uh, crystalline lattices where at long distances and in the continuum limit, I can kind of see that, that the crystal lattice sets a preferred frame. And now if I do an elastic perturbation, that frame is kind of locally changed. And that frame change can be encoded in terms of a, of a wheel bind or dry bind. Uh, and on the other hand, kind of uh, gravitational uh, theories and superconductors are kind of associated. So in the same spirit, if I take chiral superfluids or chiral superconductors in three plus one D, they will have while quasi particles. And if I now deform the order parameter, I can uh, induce non-trivial background fields, which then couple to the fermions as if gravity. And uh, there are many papers which basically write down these background fields, but uh, uh, this kind of matching is of course not perfect in the sense that, that say for lattices, there's some, uh, some non-universal constants, which are basically the constants which determine the coupling between the fermions and the lattice. And therefore this kind of universal coupling is not perfect, but nevertheless, it works. Uh, I mean, it works kind of very similarly. And I should also say that there are many ways to write down such deformations, but kind of the perspective that, that I will take is that they indeed enter as these effective uh, field bind or dry bind fields. And on the other hand, this can be now expanded close to the Fermi point uh, or, or rather the wild point as kind of a set of, of second order small relativistic uh, 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 field binds and a gauge field associated to the, to the, to the, to the firm, uh, wild point location. But it could very well be that this approximation does not commute with kind of the anomaly that is kind of induced by, by these deformations. And that indeed seems to be the case, at least when applied to these uh, non-trivial frame fields. And I should also kind of say uh, a bit that indeed in condensed matter uh, uh, kind of, in crystalline materials, this kind of local effective curve space description is kind of well known. And now comes just a question that, where would you have such a system which would kind of effectively kind of uh, couple these classical background fields to some fermions? And, and basically uh, there's at least torsion in the sense that, that, that this will be first order 
uh, or this will be already present in, 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 in first order elasticity, whereas these kind of curvature effects are a kind of higher order in gradients. But nevertheless, you could always assume that you put one single kind of probe defect, and then you look at what happens. And indeed, this has also been done by various papers and various people. Uh, but, but kind of this, what I want to focus now is, is on the kind of uh, effects that would be kind of uh, unique to this kind of gravitational or geometric or torsional uh, fields. And <clears throat> okay, we already heard an extensive uh, introduction to anomalies, but I should say that there's kind of a very a powerful yet very simple and elegant approach, which is kind of spectral flow and uh, Landau levels. And, and you can compute uh, also kind of the effect of of torsional anomalies using this method. And indeed, you kind of immediately see that there's some essential differences to, to gauge fields. So uh, let me kind of start now from, from, from relativistic fermions, which means that, that there's Lorentz invariance, the node sits at, at zero momentum. And now if I kind of replace the electromagnetic fields with, with these uh, field bind wheels, everything goes through more or less the same. Expe expect from the important point that now, uh, instead of electric charge and magnetic fields, it's momentum and torsion, which is kind of uh, uh, inducing the lambda level spectrum. And similarly, as with, with, with electromagnetism, if I now do kind of adiabatic uh, time dependent fields, I get kind of a contribution which looks like electric uh, torsional fields, if you want. But uh, this momentum dependence also makes the spectral flow uh, to depend on kind of integration in momentum space, or rather the kind of density of states of the lowest lambda level now depends on, on the momentum. And therefore, if I want to compute the spectral flow, I must take some region of momentum and integrate. And kind of, instead of all uh, states flowing universally, they will now flow as a function of their momentum. And therefore, I kind of need to put in a cutoff and I see that the kind of all the action here is, is happening close to this cutoff in the sense that that the cutoff is here. And I now see that holes are kind of moving beyond the cutoff, which kind of say that I lose them. And there's kind of non-conservation of, 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 of states. And on the other hand, for the particles or for the field states, they kind of disappear below the cutoff. And therefore kind of, if I would now say that this is a relativistic system, this scale would necessarily be at infinity just because uh, kind of Lorentz invariance is, is maintained to arbitrary scales. And therefore this is kind, comes kind of diverging, but of course that's not uh, what happens in, real, in reality, but rather there's a counter term which, which can cancel this, this whole spectral flow. But on the other hand, if I now take uh, kind of non-relativistic systems, I should take into account kind of the finite node momentum, which kind of makes the spectral flow different. But now this spectral flow looks much, much more like, like the spe spectral flow with, with say axial gauge fields. And I can even do kind of a bit more in the sense that I can kind of make a model which takes into account these non-relativistic symmetries in the sense that instead of having linearly dispensing bands, well, it at some 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 kind of small energy window, I have a quadratic band, and now I can kind of repeat uh, the calculation, and again I see that that indeed this kind of uh, scale, which was very very much not well defined for a relativistic system, actually can 
can be well defined in the sense that it's just taking into account the fact that at some point this kind of linear or kind of uh, partly uh, kind of Newton Cartan version of, 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 of a wild fermion is, is lost. And I can also apply this at finite chemi chemical potential and temperature. And then I can kind of see that this, this dimensionful scale, which used to be momentum, now is played either by chemical potential or, or the temperature. And now I should say that this chemi chemical potential is, is counted from, from the node. It's not the chemical potential, which is kind of coming from this uh, uh, finite uh, Fermi momentum. So if I now write down uh, the anomaly uh, formula or kind of the non-conservation implied by, by the breakdown of, 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 of axial uh, symmetries, uh, or actually I should say that this is now for, for a single wild fermion. Uh, uh, there's uh, this new contribution, which I previously discussed in terms of this, these uh, lambda levels. And there's many papers which have considered this, but now the point is that, that, that indeed kind of uh, a priori, this can arise in non-relativistic system in the sense that there is a cutoff, but on the other hand, this term can arise also for rel relativistic systems. And this term now should be kind of contrasted or compared with, with this kind of well-defined or quantized uh, uh, topological anomalies that, that, that are basically anomalies as understood uh, in the kind of uh, traditional sense. And what I kind of, <coughs> uh, for my cases, I will not discuss this gauge contribution at all. And also, I mean, this is geometrical or gravitational and there's in principle always this higher order term, but kind of uh, this is second order, whereas this is fourth order. So kind of in my applications where, where this arises directly from some kind of gradient expansion with weakly varying background fields, this term will, will, will not be important. And of course, uh, this term is zero if, if torsion vanishes as it vanishes in, in real uh, general relativity. But on the other hand, I kind of tried to argue that, that one should kind of generically expect this, this, uh, this field bind field, field to be present in any low energy while Dirac Hamiltonian. So of course it could be trivial, but on the other hand, if, if you do some suitable perturbations, you can induce non-trivial uh, uh, torsion. And on the other hand, uh, there could be also a spin connection, but, but, but in principle, it's totally independent uh, uh, from, from this, uh, uh, from this, uh, uh, field bind field. So in some sense, I should kind of generically expect torsion and not just uh, curvature. So, uh, okay, I've kind of at least mentioned uh, already kind of a couple of important uh, aspects of, of this anomaly or kind of uh, how it's different or very, very much different from, from the usual anomalies. And if I kind of take the language of the previous talk, it's kind of still not completely clear how does this anomaly term or kind of anomaly-like term, if you want, whether it really does survive or not, <laughs> these kind of adventures that were mentioned in the, in the cartoon. But at least from my point, there's already kind of enough evidence that makes this kind of uh, I mean, this is a point where kind of condensed matter can kind of contribute some understanding uh, to kind of uh, things that should be at least uh, interesting also from the high energy perspective. And one of them is, is kind of precisely this kind of, uh, that there's two ways of, of, of writing down these, uh, these kind of uh, uh, deformations that come from say elastic deformations and one of them uses kind of gauge fields and the other one uses these uh, geometric fields 
So the difference is more or less that whether this momentum, which is now playing the kind of effective charge, whether that's taking to be constant or whether it kind of uh, varies with respect to the to the location in, in momentum space. And this will now then produce this kind of dimensionful uh, uh, prefactor. But of course, it's also there if I just take a constant momentum, but, but then one should kind of think a bit that, that it looks kind of uh, not likely that both of these descriptions can be true in the sense that, that if I want from this kind of torsional viewpoint to, to get a prefactor, which is precisely equal to this uh, uh, Fermi momentum squared, that would basically mean that, that this linear description would be valid all the way to the bottom of the band. And that of course never true uh, in a condensed matter uh, system. But uh, on the other hand, I should kind of generically expect that, that transport properties are determined by, by properties which, which arise close uh, to the Fermi surface, or in this case, close to the, to the Fermi node. But uh, kind of independent of this, it's kind of interesting enough to kind of consider whether there's, e there's a contribution from these non-trivial geometric frame fields and spin connection or not. So uh, I guess I should at this point ask if there's any questions or comments or, or, or whether it's kind of clear now because now uh, I still have maybe 15 minutes and I now have three examples to do. I have a question to one of the formulas you have shown um, in the um, torsion flow. Can you go okay. back to the file? Because I think, I don't know, maybe it was wrong. It was before. Yeah, one more. Yes, like this. Um, yes, like this. Uh, this formulas in the in the boxes. Um, I don't understand the indices. Uh, are you now in four dimensions or in two or three dimensions? I didn't. Get oh long. yeah. Uh, it's no, it's uh, well, I mean, this is a lambda level calculation, but a lambda level calculation for three plus one d massless either Dirac or Weyl fermions. So that's. I mean, basically this dependence on the momentum is precisely on the third component. So I'm assuming a constant uh, kind of torsional magnetic field in a plane, and then there's one leftover momentum, and then I compute the, uh, the lambda levels and the spectral flow. And this, I mean, if, if I now would be in two plus one D, there would be no massless chiral fermion. And, and there would be no uh, kind of linearly uh, dispersing uh, lowest Landau level. So, okay. so looking at the formulas in the boxes, so the epsilons are four dimensional and the torsion um, objects are now in, in the non-relativistic case, there is only the third component and in the relativistic case, there, are, there is a sum over all components, right? Yeah, so that's kind of the, I mean, I should, this is maybe misleading, but this is now kind of what comes explicitly from the Landau level co uh, computation. So if I would have a relativistic system, I would immediately know that this can be only completed in a Lorentz invariant fashion, which means that I just sum these kind of local uh, flat indices. But in the non-relativistic case, there's no such thing, rather, uh, say I have a time reverse of breaking while uh, semi-metal or while system. And then I know that this has to have a built-in anisotropy, which is now basically determined by the, by the kind of uh, difference of, of the nodes in momentum space. So therefore I've left only the kind of component which is corresponding to that uh, direction. So, ah, okay. Okay, so, so mean, there's a typo probably in the red box, right? That, that one of the T should have a mu nu index and the other one, the rho C. Oh, right. Yeah. So sorry about that. That's, that's just a typo. So okay. it should be 
Oh yeah, there's a typo there. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, but this is not here. Okay, thank you. There is a question by Carl there. Yeah, can I make Go a sh short question to the same box actually to the blue box, I guess. Yeah, um, I'm a bit confused about the dimension of the right hand side in the blue box. Uh, because um, so there's momentum, then there's cutoff, both are squared. Oh, so this is yeah, dimension sorry, four, and then that looks like yeah, dimension six now. Yeah, you... yeah, sorry. So this is this is a pure number. So uh -huh. that's just kind of that. If this number would be equal to one, it would mean that I would I would expand this approximation to to all the way to the bottom. Okay. Okay. So okay. Therefore, this this is now much, much less than one. So, so you can see it here that this is kind of the, this is the dimensional piece and it's written in this fashion, just to kind of make it evident that, that this is computed around this finite node momentum. And this, this relative factor here is now the size of this box in those, in units of, 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 of Fermi momentum. Okay, okay, thanks. So um, let me now, I still have maybe 12 minutes or so, so let me kind of uh, yeah. discuss these examples. So the first one is the chiral P wave BCS uh, superconductor or superfluid, where there's kind of already well known uh, interesting hydrodynamics examples of anomalies and kind of uh, cutting uh, many details short, uh, this system has a while node, which is basically determined by the gap uh, symmetry. And therefore, even at t equals zero, it actually has a finite uh, density of normal quasi-particles, provided that there's a non-trivial texture in the order parameter. And Similarly, if you now try to kind of compute the angular momentum density of such a system, where kind of in the usual BCS limit, these pairs are very kind of extended and there's kind of, uh, they are all uh, rotating at, that, at angular momentum one, but they are very uh, sparse. And therefore kind of this local angular momentum density is not kind of the naive number where you would just take half the number of fermions uh, times the, the orbital uh, momentum of the Cooper pair. Rather, it's many, many orders of mag magnitudes uh, smaller. And also uh, the linear momentum current has this kind of anomalous piece, which is also uh, determined by this coefficient, which is kind of reducing the, the angular momentum density. And this actually can be mapped into an anomaly in the kind of uh, hydrodynamics of, of this system. And if you now compute, the anomaly is, is, is in the momentum conservation. And here I just kind of take the kind of divergence of the, of the momentum and, and momentum flux or, or energy momentum tensor uh, in total. And there, here I write in terms of these uh, hydrodynamic uh, variables of the superfluid or superconductor. And of course, I know that total momentum must be conserved. So the only way I can kind of explain this missing piece of momentum from the condensate is that it goes to these normal uh, state quasi particles. And and since these quasi-particles are effectively while, uh, or rather while Majorana uh, uh, quasi-particles, it's kind of immediately kind of uh, makes it kind of uh, plausible that, that this anomaly in the condensate hydrodynamics is explained by an anomaly related to these uh, while particles. And if I now do uh, the kind of uh, effective theory of those uh, while quasi particles and write it down, down in terms of these geometric uh, uh, quantities, I kind of discover that if I match this superfluid anomaly or, uh, or super 
fluid condensate anomaly with with the uh, with the quasi particles it's in, indeed explained by this torsional anomaly and the scale or the kind of uh, mysterious uh, uv scale which is entering this this anomaly is precisely matching the scale where this kind of linear uh, while uh, description is is breaking down so i could say that this kind of matches with, with the expectation that comes from from earlier uh, studies uh, also uh, both in kind of uh, high energy and also in in condensed matter but on the other hand this is kind of the first example that i know that makes this kind of matching or the anomaly kind of explicit so now comes the question that how should this be kind of uh, understood and i can just take the kind of uh, low energy description close to this node and in general it's described by by such an hamiltonian or or rather lagrangian where this is now a majorana while uh, or rather this is a majorana uh, fermion since since there's kind of this built-in uh, uh, particle hole symmetry in the in the in the in the paired system and this is uh, very anisotropic in the sense that this this the one of these these uh, directions uh, singled out by this this uh, field bind is given by the Fermi velocity, and on the other hand, the other uh, perpendicular ones are determined by by the superfluid uh, uh, gap. And now, if I map this previous theory to this geometric uh, uh, description, I find that that it's effectively uh, kind of, uh, or I can write all the terms in terms of these geometric quantities. I find that there's non-zero torsion, and also that that kind of these uh, conservation laws that comes from this torsional background for the fermions are kind of satisfied. The only exception, of course, is that there is this. Uh, term which is basically coming from this finite node, node momentum again and it's everything would be conserved or the the momentum or the stress energy would be conserved but there's actually the 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 chiral anomaly with these torsional geometric fields which then can be matched precisely with 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 the with the one coming from the superfluid hydrodynamics so i should make some kind of comments also that how does this kind of uh, come about and indeed it's kind of now a mixture between non-relativistic symmetries and kind of this effectively relativistic dis description which kind of from general principles i know that must be true when i'm just close enough to this 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 nodal point where where this quasi particle is behaving like like a while uh, fermion, but let me not kind of say anything more about this. So the same methods can be applied to vile semi-metals where, where I can take some, some tight binding model and then kind of see how these elastic deformations can be written in terms of these effective geometric fields. And again, now the point is that as far as I know, there's still not uh, experiments available that would kind of measure directly these effective elastic fields on the other hand i can of course map the spectrum but kind of the point of this uh this geometric anomalies is that indeed the spectrum looks the same but due to this momentum dependencies uh, the anomalies is, is is different and here in particular this scale which is basically coming from this uh from the validity of the of the wild description should be quite small which then could kind of suppress this anomaly which which okay hopefully at some day this will be measured and then kind of it will become clear whether such a formula is 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 is, is kind of uh, the correct description or not and then finally let me now kind of give uh, comments about this uh, Kind of hydrodynamic uh, uh, transport induced by 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 anomalies. That was basically the um, 
kind of uh, what was discussed uh, in the previous talk as well, but now just kind of trying to take into account uh, non-zero uh, torsion. So this is kind of just a background uh, slide. And, and now, as was kind of emphasized by the previous speaker, the important point is that kind of uh, in the hydrodynamic description, which is kind of very general, uh, one should kind of focus on the conserved quantities and kind of the term thermodynamic uh, variables. And kind of from those conservation laws, you get these kind of uh, uh, well-defined set of charges, which can kind of propagate on this hydrodynamic uh, background uh, where you have some slowly varying fields. And on the other hand, all the other kind of details are not important, but this kind of, uh, in some sense, this fermionic theory is, is used as, as, as a formal apparatus, which is then kind of integrated out. And all, the, all what remains is, is this set of conservation laws that can be anomalous and indeed are. And then comes the question that whether you have, whether you find materials where, where these anomalous conservation laws and their implications are uh, found. And indeed, if I do this kind of exercise, I have this kind of at least, or I should say that there's three well-known uh, consequences of, of, of the chiral anomaly. So the first one is the usual one. Second one is the chiral magnetic effect. And, and the third one is, is this chiral vortical effect. And now I can kind of, this is just kind of a, I mean, this is not supposed to, be taken seriously in the sense that here there's some hydrodynamic description with, with, with Dirac fermions, but on the other hand, kind of the main thing is that there's some fluid with, with some local uh, fluid velocity, which then can have this uh, uh, vertical uh, anomaly. And now the question is that what is the anomaly coefficient of, of that thing? And indeed, it's kind of, a, well, there's many, or at least several different ways to understand this prefactor. One comes from, from say, kind of uh, restrictions on, on entropy current. Second one comes from, from these gravita gravitational anomalies. Third one, you could say that comes from holography. And then maybe a third one comes just from considering free fermions in, say, rotating uh, uh, systems, which, which is indeed discovered quite long ago, but only in that kind of special uh, case. And now it comes kind of natural question that what would now happen on, on, on torsional backgrounds, especially in the sense that this coefficient looks very much like, was like what I discussed for, for torsional, uh, for the torsional anomalies. And on the other hand, there's been always this kind of slightly mysterious uh, point that how could this kind of fourth order uh, gravitational anomaly contribute already at at kind of linear response or already at at at, at lowest order in the hydrodynamic uh, uh, expansion? And there's some kind of important differences whether I assume that there's just a metric and metric variations. If I then kind of extend this to the case where there's independent uh, field bind, independent connection, or kind of independent spin connection, these variation comes different. And on the other hand, if I now take this anomaly from torsion seriously, uh, this kind of conservation looks laws that comes from the field theory description look different. And therefore, I could expect that there's indeed some, some differences. And actually, I think that all these can be made consistent in the sense that, that if I go back to this uh, kind of geometric description of, of the chiral effect, this already looks kind of the same as, as, as a non-trivial time-like uh, field bind. But, but OK, this is in the time-like direction. I could then ask the question that is there a piece which comes from also from the spatial uh, components. And indeed, kind of this spatial torsion is, is what kind of generically should 
arise in, in condensed matter wild systems. And now if I look at these formulas, I can basically map a torsional uh, background in linear response to a background which is which which doesn't have torsion but has some other fields or 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 say uh, a an effective gauge field or an effective kind of uh, fluid uh, uh, velocity. So then I can also just check the 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 Cooper formula in the sense that now if I take into account that that on torsional backgrounds, I should use the kind of uh, hydrodynamic variations that correspond to, uh, to those uh, hydrodynamic degrees or, or rather sources, then I found that actually this, this Kuba formula for, uh, for the chiral vertical effect is composed of two pieces, which actually are equal in the DC limit or in the limit where, uh, where frequency goes to zero and then momentum. But okay, if I go beyond that limit, these two contributions will be different. But on the other hand, that's also precisely the place where this kind of non-renormalization of the chiral vertical uh, coefficient is also known to, to be violated. So uh, in my view, then this kind of perfectly matches uh, kind of now the difference is whether I have torsion or just a metric. And therefore the anomaly kind of becomes different because I assume extra degrees of freedom in addition to just having the, the metric. And in some sense, this kind of appearance of, of, of the chiral effect kind of from gravitational uh, contributions is also explained by the fact that actually this torsional anomaly is uh, second order and therefore should kind of appear naturally uh, at lowest order in, in the gradient expansion. So of course all of these comments kind of apply to this temperature piece in the sense that this this chemical potential piece can be explained by kind of by the chiral anomaly itself. And uh, in the absence of having kind of torsion in the real world, I could now try to compare these two anomalies, the chiral vertical effect and the chiral torsional effect in some system which should have both in the sense that I can take this chiral superfluid, which can be described in terms of these torsionful geometrical quantities, and then I can just rota rotate it. And then in some sense, or a kind of in the very direct sense, I know that this rotation should uh, induce uh, uh, a current along uh, uh, the rotation axis. And now uh, there's kind of this Meissner effect where, where I rotate a, a condensate and then a lat vortex lattice is formed. And then uh, uh, at equilibrium, it's canceled. And indeed, I can now kind of match these two different sources of, of the anomaly and, and they cancel. And I can also do this at higher order and with different pieces and, and okay, it remains kind of an open problem how to, how to kind of extend this kind of lowest order terms to higher orders and kind of properly taking into account this non-relativistic geometry. But, I'm over time, so let me just stop here. And this is kind of my, my, my conclusions and outlook. And I should say that indeed there's kind of many places where I would expect that not necessarily kind of exactly the same type of geometric things come into play, but I mean, the ideas are very similar in the sense that there's some sort of weird UV IR coupling and there's kind of weird sets of, of field theories which are somehow inherently non-relativistic and therefore kind of extend relativistic anomalies to, to, to kind of cases which, which, which are not uh, found in, in kind of uh, real world Lorentz invariant 
uh, theories. Let's thank uh, Professor Nissinen and uh, we open the discussion. If there are some questions, please uh, go ahead. We have time for a couple of questions. Carl, go ahead, please. Hi, yeah, thanks for the, for the nice talk. Um, I have a couple of uh, questions and comments. So one is on, and I think you mentioned this also in the beginning. I mean, if you stay just in the realm of a relativistic quantum field theory, then um, the, this uh, Niyan anomaly can be removed by adding a counter term to the, to the uh, effective action. Uh, and, and it doesn't destroy any other, this counter term doesn't destroy any other of the symmetries. So, so it just restores the, the conservation of the axial current. Uh, and so from the relativistic quantum field theory perspective, I would say there is no um, other anomaly for, 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 for the axial current than the, the, the known ones, the gauge and the gravitational. So, uh, and and in particular, that means that you can find the, uh, that you can define a relativistic quantum uh, field theory with uh, chiral fermions, which wouldn't have this uh, torsional anomaly, but still it would have this full chiral vortical effect with the t squared term and everything. So therefore, therefore, I think uh, it should be rather attributed to. I'm, I'm not sure how much it can be really attached to to this. Uh, uh, torsional anomaly. Yeah, um, well, I have two comments. So the first one is related indeed to this fact that how can you explain this, this presence of this anomaly term? Let's just call it anomaly term for simplicity. And indeed, the way you kind of escape these theorems is that, that indeed, if you have strict Lorentz invariance, I think this, this kind of UV part Will just vanish, and already the simple Landau level description shows you that. Mm -hmm. And of course, well, you of course know this, but of course you can then pretty much take any uh, uh, any regularization or any framework where you compute the anomaly. And I would expect that you should indeed find that this term disappears. Okay. And then comes the temperature term. And of course, as you discussed, uh, if I have an anomaly, an anomaly, which is proportional to say t squared, then this is not an anomaly in the traditional sense. And then comes the question then, what is it then? And then we basically go to this uh, second question that you ask or second comment in that indeed, uh, Okay, would you say now that the chiral vertical effect is that unusual anomaly term or not? But still, I mean, still, if you now take any theory or any framework where you can have this, this non-trivial vorticity uh, present, then you should indeed find that there's a contribution. And now I can understand this contribution in terms of this metric. But, but now I have a theory which is described by a metric and some say some other uh, thermo thermodynamic variables. But that theory will be a different theory where I have now torsion in the sense that, that, that you can already see from these hydrodynamic relations that, that they are not equivalent. So yeah, but in, in that's kind of a- that's a more general question that say, I give you a theory of while uh, fermions. And now first question is of course, that what are the relevant degrees of freedom and degrees of freedom in the sense that these kind of background fields are included or kind of these hydrodynamic relations right. with sources. And now that's a separate question. And now you should first kind of answer that question that 
does this description kind of, does it work with torsion or not? And if it works with torsion, then of course this description here is no longer valid. And then you should use this. And then you basically find that kind of what used to be chiral vertical effect can be also directly uh, explained in terms of this torsional anomaly with no difference. And then that's now kind of, kind of how, do, how, how do you, uh, I mean, that's the only way that these two descriptions can be consistent. So this is kind of a funny example in the sense that, <coughs> that, that here I kind of only use the kind of rotational picture of, of CVE. But of course I know that, 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 that if I describe the system with torsion, then I cannot kind of both use a metric, or I mean, I can use a metric which looks the same, but it still doesn't answer the question that whether in addition to the metric, I also have extra degrees of freedom, which are basically now played by, by, by the field line and spin connection, taking us to be independent. And maybe our kind of final comment about this is that indeed it's already known about this Lorentz anomaly that, that you say that you have a gravitational anomaly in the usual sense, then it's known that this is not independent or I mean the fact whether you have the usual anomaly or the Lorentz anomaly, this, this is not independent. Rather you can kind of shift one from the other. And of course, at the end of the, of the day, I think that what should be kind of what should decide where you put this anomaly term is of course this kind of, uh, I mean, what are the real degrees of freedom? So, so, I mean, the anomaly can be put into many places, but kind of the correct physical realization should be the one which is using the, the, the kind of correct, if you want hydrodynamic degrees of freedom. So therefore, I, I don't think that they are the same in the sense that this vertical effect is kind of in the time-like part of the metric. And then if you take the torsional anomaly, there's also the, the, the special contribution. And as far as I know, this kind of, I mean, this is a velocity, so this cannot be kind of directly just transferred to the, to the, to the other cases. Okay. okay. Uh, well, well, I'm sorry. Uh, we have time for one last question, if necessary. Would somebody like to add some comment or question? Well, if not, we're getting short of time. So we again thank uh, Professor Nissinen for this nice talk. And we 